Hello and welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network where we dive deep into our both most bibliophilic work five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we are back to talk about Possession 15.5. Um, yeah. So Blake is properly uh, possessing Rose, I guess, now. Um, <laughs> or uh, when I say possession, I guess I think of like controlling their movements the way Faisal was doing with Johannes before. But this is just Blake being a passenger <laughs> inside Rose's <laughs> brain. Um, and he looks around their shared brain slash soul to try and find uh, the source of Conquest's laughing. So let's just talk about this a whole bunch because... Mm-hmm. I mean, this is such an awesome mechanic, and I think it, it kind of felt like this chapter was doing a lot of work to establish what this possession is like, which, I mean, I, I, it's interesting. I don't know if we're going to be in here for that long. I, it, like, I mean, well, there's not that long to be in here left for. <laughs> the story's not that <laughs> long anyway, but like, I, I don't know if I believe we're going to be in here in Arc 16, so I, I kind of feel like I'm going to walk away from this possession mechanic mourning the fact that it wasn't like half the story because it's so cool yeah uh, it's awesome yeah. isn't it um like, especially i think i'm gonna be honest when last chapter ended and like, i can't remember exactly how it's phrased but i definitely got the vibe that at, at the end of last chapter that blake was just kind of in like an endless you know void like being inside janet in the mm. good place yeah and i i was a little bit disappointed with that because i was like oh like there's so much room to be cool here especially in pact and especially because i know wild Bo can do it and I was kind of like, oh, is Possession just going to be like it is in every boring movie or something where you're just sort of inside and there's TV screens around? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not that. And so that's cool. Because um, especially what I like about it is there's there's so much more to it, but it, it's unfolding f- for Blake as well as for us. Like, it, it, you know, Blake has no idea what the fuck he's doing in here. So he <laughs> he's he's having these revelations about what he can do. And so that's why the sort of increasing complexity and abstractness of it works very easily for us because we start with Blake operating on the assumption that it's just kind of a, a white void and then he starts to realize that's not true. And so it's kind of like, it, it's a much easier way to work us into like something that just doesn't make sense in like real space. Yeah, it, it feels a bit like Blake is kind of learning each of the dimensions that exist inside this reality, right? His yeah. first thought was, oh, this is just a one or two dimensional space, and then it's three dimensional, and then he gets this fourth dimension where he can kind of zoom in and out, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think I think it, it works because I got the really abstract weird shit that I wanted, but it's introduced piece by piece at in nar- in the narrative because Blake's figuring it out. So it it's not something that like alienates normal people because like this is exactly what I wanted. A normal person probably wants something much more understandable and so while both kind of eased us into the weird shit so that you everyone can be on board with it hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. It's a it's a real crowd pleaser. <laughs> <laughs> um I mean like and I think I think that this just again like not only is this mechanic awesome in so many ways that we're going to get into but it, it's it just feels so packed like the way everything feels symbolic mm. um like he I, he kind of explicitly looks at part of their personalities as pillars which you know like it's the pillars of their of their personality like it, it's just it's perfect and like <laughs> it, it got me wondering like there's a bit where blake specifically compares it to using the site and I was thinking, like, I wonder if if this representation of him and Rose is unique to him. Like, it, like Conquest might see this world completely differently. Like, it, it might be so interpretive that this is just how him or, or even how other spirits, like, just how they see these abstract spaces. Like, it's as custom for him as it would be for anyone else. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it it definitely feels like he is influencing the environment in a very tangible way just by being there and so i can even see that it it is kind of interpretive the way that he's seeing the world because Mm. it is it really does feel like kind of a five or six dimensional space being viewed through a three-dimensional lens yeah yeah exactly and i mean like for me this just raised so many various questions about like spirits how they view things where blake is on that whole spectrum like there's there's so much cool shit that i the story probably isn't going to go into especially at this point um but it's it's just so cool to imagine the other spirits or other things possessing other things yeah having this totally different view because it's yeah yeah experience shapes a lot of reality in in the pact verse anyway 
And this is such like a pure representation of that because it's a spirit interacting with like a, a soul or another spirit, you know? So it's like, it, it's an interpretive squared kind of, kind of deal. <laughs> and it's convenient that the two people, the one interpreting and the one being interpreted are so similar, I suppose, for this example. Yeah. Well, that's what's so fun about this specific example as well is it's like, it, we're not just dealing with all the regular possession mm. abstractness that's going on, but in, in particular, the way Blake and Rose kind of fit together as, a worn down jigsaw oh, is like yeah. this other layer of, of fascinating it, um it, it it it's like a perfect example this whole chapter of the the way that pact takes the things that are like metaphorical or abstract kind of themes in other works and makes them explicitly literal <laughs> i absolutely <laughs> love this chapter for it because you look at a sentence um I have a quote from a bit later on I'm going to pull in where Blake looks at this kind of TV screen, which is a pretty good trope of like the way that someone subsumed views the outside world. Like it appeared in Get Out, right? Um, Yeah. Where the main character in Get Out sees the world through their eyes, but it's like a TV screen in a void. Um, Anyway, so Blake thinks, a crack in the television screen. No matter what we did, we'd be working on a different plane, unable to affect that screen. Um, So their soul explicitly has two discrete viewpoints and that can't ever be repaired and that's something that is just a perfect literal representation of the fact that they'll never be able to see eye to eye a hundred percent like it's the <laughs> yeah. it's it's exactly what pack does it's take take metaphor and make it literal in a very cool way yeah a- absolutely um i also really like the one where blake notes one of the pillars is a bit more of an arch but mm. it's been cut in two and he sort of studies the edges of the arch and notes how the the way they've been sort of serrated down, like they they won't ever fit back together. Yeah, um, like it, it's a similar sort of deal. Although the TV screen, you're right, comes with that added like seeing eye to eye connotation, which I really like. <laughs> well, um, the the one you mentioned of the pillar never being fitting back together. There's also I can't remember if it's that pillar or another part, but parts where Blake notices that sometimes the things will shift and grind and break each other with friction, yeah, yeah. which is, again, a perfect example of Blake and Rose. When they're next to each other, it's just friction, <laughs> right? Like, they just break each other down. Yeah, well, that's what's so fascinating about this particular possession is that they're simultaneously such a good and such a bad fit. Like, I, yes. I'm so curious to see more about what Blake being inside Rose is is doing because, on the one hand, he kind of almost perfectly slots into every gap she has, but on the other hand, it's it's not a perfect fit, and as as you said, like he he notices that they're kind of grinding on each other. Yeah. So how how might that manifest? Like how is this going to be both simultaneously an incredibly smooth possession that drives them both up the wall? Like that's kind of where I'm seeing it going. Yeah. And and I'm so curious to to sort of see how that manifests. Um. Also, like this is just a side note, but I, I'm I'm getting more and more curious about the distinction between a soul and a spirit, and I'm not mm. expecting an answer at this point, but like. I'd be so interested to hear from everyone else. Maybe we'll make that a discussion question in the future. Like, what, like what, what, what is a soul in the Pact universe? Yeah, interesting, interesting. What? So Blake is describes himself as a spirit now, right? Like, yeah, that's how he's seeing himself in this scenario. And I kind of see this void that he's in as Rose's soul or their shared soul. You know, well, Ross's that's the thing. Soul. I mean. Blake and Rose are a particularly good place to examine what a soul is because in theory they're one that got cut in half and has been had various bits replaced yeah, like I, like they're obviously a very unique example of what a soul is but um you obviously have things like Evan as well that represent it yes. so uh, it, it's probably not important to the story but this is like the the world building fan in me just kind of obsessing over a a world building detail yeah yeah definitely um I guess we're going to sum up this chapter, but this chapter is kind of expressed through a lot of weird abstract metaphors. And so it's yeah. a kind of chapter that it, it really is kind of interpretive in a lot of ways. And so we'll sum it up in our way, but there might be some different interpretations that people might take from various things, which is good too. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, like something something that you just sort of skipped over in your own notes that I want to bring up because I thought it was good is how, how you mentioned how Blake is so willing to trust himself to jump to the right mm. conclusions when dealing with all this because it's him as much as it's sort of rose yeah um and I mean, he, like, he knows himself so he can make he can jump to those conclusions about himself right yeah yeah like i i, I just thought that's so fascinating and as we potentially see uh him and conquest go toe to toe within rose's psyche moving forward like i think that that may be the thing that pushes him over the line the fact mm. that he can trust that this is 
or this was him as much as it is him as well. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, so yeah, Blake is kind of exploring more and he finds that he's able to look at memories that he sees around. Um, and he starts looking at some of Rose's memories and then comparing them to what he remembers of his experiences to kind of see how they were made different. Yeah. And like, I think the, the big thing I took away from this was, and like, you know, it kind of seems obvious in retrospect, but I think it's good that uh, we get reminded of it. Like a, a memory is more than just like a, an old tape recording. Like, mm-hmm. the memory is as much, like, the feelings and, and the associations, um, and that's something that starts to become a lot more, like, relevant towards the end as we see Conquest, um, but, like, this this is where we start to lay the groundwork of making sure we understand that, you know, like, Blake Blake has this memory that's just a sticker, and he has no emotions <laughs> attached to it, he just, he just got a picture of a sticker, and then Rose has, like, you know, all the memories associated with getting the sticker, how proud she was, like all the all the all really all the significant bits like when it comes to this memory rose really got what's important and blake presumably just got the sticker because it has a bird on it and birds are his thing i guess um like yeah i guess that's the only reason he kind of got the picture um yeah but like, like this is laying the groundwork like it kind of immediately establishes blake got this shitty leftover <laughs> the, the the picture doesn't matter what what mattered was the the association and the feeling behind it yeah um something that feels especially i guess invasive to me is the way that blake and rose's relationship to their parents is made so different um Mm. like we see rose having a relationship with her mother at least that is a little bit red flaggy but not fully shitty and (laughs) blake is just like well that's not what my parents were like (laughs) It's so yeah, great. there's there's definitely a vibe of um like Blake sees this mostly happy memory of Rose and and the mum and you just get the vibe from his reaction that's like well he doesn't have anything like that yeah um I, and I mean like uh, it'd be really interesting depending on how long Blake's in here like this seems like such a perfect avenue to do some self reflecting because <laughs> like now he can literally walk around and see what what parts are him what parts are Rose and like how those were split. I mean, it's Blake, so I'm not holding my breath that he's going to take the time to do some self-reflection. Um, it's my favorite meta joke of this entire book, <laughs> that Blake and Rose spend so much time in mirrors and they hate reflecting on themselves. <laughs> it's um, just so perfect. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. They're, they're, well, they don't have re- a reflection, so they don't, yeah, they don't exactly. self-reflect. So of course um, they can't self-reflect. Like, like, but, you know, like, I can see a world where Blake just spends days going through these memories and and sort of coming to understandings about himself but um conquest is here to keep him busy from from that i guess yeah yeah i guess conquest is the distraction that that uh or you know it, it's the next thing for him to fight like can't <laughs> not have a thing you know yeah it, like funnily enough there's there's a number of beats in this chapter where blake just sort of mentions you know oh, i can't affect rose's body her thoughts are more malleable and like <laughs> You know, like when you read that, you're sort of like, oh no, like set off, set off all the alarms, like danger, danger. Yeah. Um, but now I'm actually wondering if that's, that is going to be important and how things go. Like, I think it could be really cool to see Blake try and do exactly what Conquest is doing, but with, with like a good heart, I guess. Mm. Uh, like, like, what does that look like? I don't know. That could be really fun, but we'll, we'll sort of get there as we talk more about what Conquest is up to. Yes, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, before then, I just want to touch on this little bit where when Blake's looking in Rose's memory, she's referred to as, well, R-O-S, with the implication, and then the, the memory kind of, you know, it has static. Like skips. Yeah. yeah. Um, obviously, you can interpret that as either Rose or uh, Ross, and so it's kind of confirmation in my mind that their name was actually Ross, which is a nice little, I don't know, beat. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of like the, I, like, I agree that that's probably more evidence that it's something like Ross rather than Rusty. <laughs> um, Rusty. But I, I kind of like that it hasn't ever been explicitly 100% confirmed. Yeah. Because, it, it, like, Ross, Rusty, um, whatever, they're gone, like, ir- irrecoverably so. We just talked about how yes. this chapter is, again, reinforced that they're not going to glue yeah. themselves back together. Um. And and so it's like you know that that person is gone. It's like exactly what their name is doesn't really matter. Like they they they're gone. It's about Blake and Rose now. Oh yeah, it's fair. I just like these little bits of like filling in the gaps, you know. Yeah, that's fair. 
I mean, I was just complaining about like wanting to know what a soul is versus a spirit. So it's just yeah. like it, I, it kind of feels like a bit of a theme of this chapter. Like we get to see the kind of tangible examples and the literal examples of how they've been split up and and what that you know practically means. Those kinds of things, and it's not something that I feel like we you know needed to see because we already kind of know. Oh yeah, they are split up because of memories and all this stuff. But it's nice to just see it in practice and see how it all actually works just as a nice little scratch of the itch of like, well, how does that work? Yeah, no, th- th- that's true. Um, and, and again, like, I, I feel like this, this segment really, really convincingly sets up like the whole idea of memories being more than just the raw events. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's kind of the emotional vibe that carries through and defines who you are, right? Yeah. And of course, like, I love this because that's how it works in real life. But of course, like that's so packed as well right like I yes think, of course it's important in the world of pact that aspect of memories because uh, yeah like i i think i think that the, it's it's important and that's how it works in real life but it's it's in retrospect it's so obvious that that's the focus in pact yeah yeah definitely um so yeah blake kind of starts to adjust to this plane of existence um he's getting his bearings and he realizes that he's able to kind of shift his focus uh and focus on Rose's consciousness, and then see the world through her eyes. Yeah, and, and so obviously, like, I love how he kind of just zooms out of existence. To, do they? Yeah. Do they mention? Like, does Walbo? Like, does Walbo call it zooming out? Because you wrote zooms out, and I said it before. And that's what it feels like. It's a very weird, like, human way of trying to comprehend yeah, I, this. I, abstract I'm pretty sure movement. that exact. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's exactly the term that's used. Uh, like, okay. I think Blake phrases it as zoom zooming out. Um. But like I think I think something else that is a, a beat that's been hit a number of times over the last chapter and a bit that um he he references here as well is how puny as a spirit he is. Um, in fact, there's a number of times throughout both the or through this chapter, sorry, where he he specifically refers to himself or he's referred to as raw. Um, yeah, and, and like it just sort of started to make me wonder like how what he's experiencing now compares to the experience of the spirits that were in him. Like, you know, the, whatever manifestation of the abyss was in him. Like, I, I don't know. I, it's just so cool. I, I already sort of talked about how varied I think it might be. Um, I, like I, I could read a million word story, just exploring, possessing things. Um, yeah. This is, this is such a cool mechanic. Yeah, no, it's very cool. I, I think the thing I like about it most is something that we kind of realize in this chapter is he's not just seeing through Rose's eyes is he's, he's, kind of basically reading her thoughts like it's yeah. basically like the story just for a little bit goes into rose's perspective um and i love this because rose has always been a character that is kind of defined by only getting to see her how blake sees her like only getting to yeah. see her through blake's eyes and now we finally get to see things from her perspective and i'm so excited for it <laughs> and it really pays off even just in this chapter yeah i think there's been about like six or seven ends of the arc where i'm like oh boy i hope it's a rose interlude like yes. I've, I've wanted a rose interlude for so long but this is even better because not only do we finally get to see inside her head but blake is sitting right next yep. to us and so we're seeing him see from her perspective and then like given their relationship like that's that's so powerful as well so this is like this is even better than a rose interlude not only because it's probably going to go for longer than a chapter um, but it, it has the added dynamic of Blake seeing it as much as we are. Yeah. Um, so a great example of how this perspective shift humanizes her is she gets on a little train of thought about Alistair and like what she thinks about him and whether she can imagine having a future with him. And it's like, it's so human. I absolutely love it. Um, and I'm so on board for their budding relationship, which feels <laughs> weird to say because they're married, but it is a budding relationship so well they're not they're not married yet right they're still sure, just they're engaged. engaged yeah yeah um i guess i'm splitting hairs at that point um i mean yeah you're right like i mean this just threw me straight back to jeremy talking about sandra in his interlude remember the bit where he was like i'm like yeah. totally not in love with her i just kind of see myself being with her forever and living living yeah. happily um yeah. and, and like it feels like rose is sort of where jeremy was right before he was there like i I kind of got really good vibes from this, maybe from that chapter, but it was just like her, I think there's genuine interest in in wanting 
to want Alistair. Like, yeah, and, I think it's uh, it's the next step for someone who has a very analytical mind to kind of reconcile <laughs> their emotional feelings towards somebody. Yeah, and for um, like what is in in many ways like an extremely shotgun wedding. Yes. Um, <laughs> like he, he could, it could have been going a lot worse. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I'm kind of starting to root for these two, which is weird because I've hated them both viscerally at various parts of the story, <laughs> and now and now I'm kind of on board with their with their like budding marriage. With their so like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, yeah, it, you're right. It was just seeing it all from Rose's perspective kind of made the relationship feel so much more real, and that yeah. was really fun. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, this is a fun chapter, right? Like, it feels like a fun chapter. Maybe it's just because we're coming off of the intense horror of the library, (laughs) but this chapter really has a lot of really fun moments and really human kind of down-to-earth moments as well. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I think think part of the reason it works as well is obviously because there's still intense and important stuff going on for Blake. Like, Blake is inside Rose with Conquest, kind of so there's still this sense of action and, and foreboding and danger but none of that's happening for the others so whenever we <laughs> we do sort of cut to them there is really you know all that sense of like well of course you know for them the battle has just kind of ended and they're they're having their sort of cool down and, and just trying to get along and, and be human yeah and and so that's happening meanwhile like blake's still in the shit but his thing is actually separate, so you kind of get the best of both worlds. Yeah, it's out of sight, out of mind for the rest of them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, a great example is Peter is back again, <laughs> uh, and he has some real strong moments here. Um, oh, he's he's shit stirring the pot like yes, a champ. Yes, there's a bit where uh, everyone's obviously like, wait, where's Blake? And Rose points to her heart, and Peter's response is, "You're going to remember him forever." <laughs> <laughs> Which is such a, like a stupid thing to say. I absolutely love it. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. He's um, he's 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 just such a he's such a dick, <laughs> and, and it's, it's but in a fantastic way. Like I'd hate to be around him in real life, but like reading this, it's just he's yeah. so entertaining. Yeah, and uh, it's I think. Well, yeah, I think the, speaking about what Peter does in this chapter, we should talk about how. From this point on, Deep Impact, is our format's going to change a bit. We're going to ignore the rest of the story, and we're just going to focus on Peter and Ainsley's relationship and how that goes, <laughs> because that's it, the best part of the story so far. And so we'll just focus on that, I think, from now on. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. Um, uh, yeah, I kind of love how this sort of seemingly comes out of nowhere, and like <laughs> Pe- Peter and Ainsley's relation to, uh, sorry, reaction to it is so hilarious. Like Peter seems. Seems more invested in fucking with Alistair yes. than he does in genuinely chasing <laughs> Ainsley. Uh, Ainsley is a mixture of befuddled and annoyed yeah. by the whole situation because um, you know she didn't sort of realize what was happening. Um, I, I mean, <laughs> and I think I think it's interesting how these two are set up as as kind of exact opposites. Yeah, right from the get go, like something we specifically bring up is you know Ainsley rushes to Alistair and she's kind of mothering him is is the word that Rose uses for it yeah whereas like Rose looks at Peter and Peter's like oh you look like shit um and and so we kind of not only are we kind of I think comparing the Baham and and Thorburn families but specifically Peter and Ainsley and yeah I don't know I don't know what's going to happen with these two going forward but like (laughs) it did feel like there was some some effort spent in the story beyond just the joke of actually kind of contrasting them. And I I wonder if that's going anywhere. Yeah. If we may borrow a metric from one of our sister shows, um, and what you say, they do the relationship meter. So my question (laughs) to you, Elliot is relationship meter, uh, Peter and Ainsley, where are they at? One to 10. I'm going to give them a a four, but like trending upwards, you know, Mm. like, like forecast, forecast increases. I don't know how stocks work. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, but you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, sure. Upwards trend stocks. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) yeah, I I think the thing to focus on for this kind of middle part of the chapter is uh, I can't touch on it before. These are just such great, like human moments. It's such a, it's such a well-written section of just people having small interactions that you just lose yourself in completely. Yeah, like uh, they've definitely talked about it a bunch on um over on We've Got Worm and We've Got Ward, like just how stellar Wabo is at creating these groups of people and then putting them together and extracting like hilarious banter. Mm. Um, like he he defines characters so strongly that you can sort of throw them in a group and 
we know exactly who's saying what and kind of what to expect, but it still hits us hard when it happens. Like it's he he's so good at building characters and then also yeah. throwing throwing them all in a room together. Um, it's and, and wait, this is a great example of it. Absolutely, yes, it's so much fun. I I don't want to move away from it, but the chapter does after a while. <laughs> um, the 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 group kind of decides to head to the Bahame house because obviously the Thorburn house is gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, as they go, Rose kind of looks behind and sees Green Eyes basically stalking right behind her ready to pounce at any given moment at the moment green eyes has absolutely no chill is yes. basically what's happening um i mean it was funny because obviously we had that section of the story where green eyes was kind of hazing tiffany um because she obviously at some point must have picked up that there was you know at various times a bit of a spark between tiff and, and blake mm. um rose is getting just the aggro part of that right now like yeah uh, rose is essentially keep it, keeping Blake um, from Green Eyes, and uh, Green Eyes is not <laughs> not happy about it. Yeah, yeah. And I think the thing that's really interesting to me is Rose looks at Green Eyes and describes her to us, and the description is pure abyss monster, right? It's purely yeah. monstrous, and there's none of the, like, kind of kindness or playfulness that we have seen in Green Eyes through Blake's interactions. It's just monstrous. And I think it's really interesting way of showing us oh shit like we're we're proper in rose's head now yeah absolutely like it, it's it's such a harsher description of all of her physical features it it, it reads very as a very stark contrast to even like blake's harshest descriptions of her when he yeah. first met her like the, yeah you're right this was for me when it sort of clicked that a lot of the point of viewness that we were getting was actually explicitly roses and not blake's yeah um like I, I kind of expected them to... I, I, I kind of still thought we were sort of Blake looking through the window, but this is very much we're getting Rose's stream of consciousness. And in fact, like, Blake is actually the one... For most of the section of this chapter, Blake is interjecting in italics, which is exactly what the Abyss used to do with him. Like, you know, we used to get those those intruding <laughs> thoughts from yes. the Abyss in italics, and now Blake is the intruding thought in, in Rose's um, consciousness, although I don't think he's at the point where he's intruding those thoughts in into her consciousness it's more just like his his comments um but yeah like this green eyes a bit really starts to establish we're in rose's point of view with with blake chiming in yes because you know i would have thought we would have just seen rose's point of view and maybe her perspective but it's not that it is still blake's perspective but just like tainted by rose you know well, it's kind of he is watching her stream of consciousness, right? In 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 the abstract space that he's in. Yeah. So he's not just seeing what her eyes see, but he's getting, well, he's getting everything that's passing through her consciousness, which is also her opinions and her mood and stuff, and and, and so he kind of has to keep interjecting to separate his own feelings from from that because they're not always the same thing because these two are not always on the same page. Well, yes, they're not, but we'll see later that they're uh, they're merging more than you might have thought. Yeah. Um, anyway, Blake kind of zooms back in, I guess, <laughs> and uh, he's back in uh, their soul, and he sees um, conquest's influence. I guess is the way to describe it. It's it's vines and flowers mostly, but kind of things that are tied to conquest spreading and, and moving over the landscape. Um, and Blake kind of moves to intercept this spreading influence. Yeah, so I think Rose taps Conquest to make Peter shut the fuck up, um, and, and so Blake sort of takes the time to s track Conquest's movement throughout her consciousness. Yep. Um, and so obviously something that jumps out to me, or, or jumped out to me here that, like, you know, quickly becomes more established is obviously how Conquest's pronouns have changed. Yeah. Um, like, Conquest is now a she. And anyway, this is really, I think, our first sign of how ingrained or, or in tune with Rose Conquest is right now. Um, cause we kind of know conquest gets their form a lot from previous hosts. Yes. And, and so I think this is starting to show how, how much conquest is also maybe taking from Rose. Yeah. And, and she's inhabiting, uh, the female personifications inside these memories as well, right? Like she's a female minister here and she becomes their mother later. Um, mm. Yeah, she she's definitely clearly taking a lot from Rose's memories, both figuratively and again literally, because it's yeah. bad. 
and we're gonna, we're gonna sort of see you know soon how how much conquest is in rose but obviously like that sort of transfer of power or whatever is seemingly starting to go both ways because conquest is seemingly being shaped by rose to some extent or is maybe better shaping herself to affect rose i, I don't know uh, like it could be either i suppose mm. um but to to quickly revisit a segment that we haven't done for a while um uh, I I tried to Google what these vines with white flowers were because Conquest always took the form of some sort of like invasive species or, yeah. or had invasive species with them. Um, and so I'm pretty sure these vines with white flowers are Clematis turniflora or um, Sweet Autumn Clematis, which is this vine with white flowers that was native to Asia. It was brought to North America and is now a pest, uh, particularly along the eastern parts of North America, which you know, Toronto fits within that. So, <laughs> yep. um, you know, just it's just fun to see that Wabo hasn't forgotten that little detail of stuff that he used to do <laughs> fucking almost a year ago now for us. Yeah. Um, I, and I'm, and it's still worked that in. I'm so glad you looked that up because I completely forgot about the invasive species thing and it makes me so happy that it's still uh, part of Conquest's, like, representation in the story is the invasive species that they surround themselves with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so... I also really love the idea that Conquest is taking on the forms of, like, important or possibly just terrifying people from from Blake and Rose's memories. The minister, obviously, is someone that was seen as a kind of powerful and imposing figure, and obviously yeah. their mother is <laughs> also uh, <laughs> a, a bit of a mess relationship-wise, and it just adds this mindfuckery to Conquest being just not not just physical domination, but, like breaking you mentally as well because of course that's what she is yeah yeah and and of course it's it totally makes sense like when when blake sort of asks why this memory i was sort of immediately like well there's going to be something conquesty in this in this memory and that and that's sort of exactly where it goes and of course later on conquest takes the form of of their grandma which is like spot on um <laughs> and because like yeah this makes sense conquest wants to spread conquest or you know is going to take over via conquest so of course yep. she she's finding these memories that, that have conquest associations and and sort of planting roots um in there which is you know what the sweet autumn clementus does uh as part of the problem with why it spreads it can sprout <laughs> roots anywhere um thanks but, thanks Elliot. <laughs> uh, uh like it, it's funny like just this sort of idea got me like thinking about things like you know when when blake when Blake found out that his friends had sort of betrayed him and that really affected him and his relationship with like, you know, mentally with like Alexis and stuff, it never recovered. And you can totally sort of picture the abyss, like when that memory started to get shattered by that revelation, the abyss just like stuck all of its twigs in mm. and, and kind of took over the memory. Yeah. Um, it, it like, you know, it's, it's interesting how the, the mechanics of this chapter have like inspired me to picture what was happening inside Blake for so much of the story. Yeah, interesting. I wonder, yeah, thinking about the Abyss's influence in in this space, we don't really see any remnants of it because obviously it doesn't exist anymore, but it's quite easy to imagine it filling the gaps in the ways that Conquest now does. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so we see Conquest gaining ground here. We see what that, again, we see the literal, uh, the the um, metaphorical gaining influence turned literal um, <laughs> as Conquest's vines kind of spread as Rose draws on Conquest and then retracts as Conquest retracts, but of course doesn't retract as much as it used to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, like, especially this is that whole thing. Like, Conquest, unless you absolutely force her, isn't isn't going to give up any ground that no, she gained. No, of course. Like, that, <laughs> like that's, that's her whole thing. And, you know, Rose kind of knows that this is going on because you know, well, conquest basically says she's not stupid, and she'd have to be to to not realize this was happening. Yeah, um, which felt like a bit of a direct ta- attack on Blake, but whatever. <laughs> um, uh, like this just kind of had me thinking, like, what's what's Rose's long term plan here? Like, yeah. that's kind of meant to be her thing, right? She's she's the one who plans because because I mean, we know it's not Blake. Yeah. Um. So unless Ross just had no ability to plan ahead, uh, Rose must have ended up with it. So she she must have a plan, right? I mean, I hope so. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. I I mean, is it a situation where if Conquest is able to get 
you know, the majority stake in the soul, then she just takes over? Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, there's there's a lot of questions here. Like, as, as Conquest is going to point out to us soon, Blake and us have very little fucking idea of how this space works. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Uh, should we talk about um, this moment where uh, Blake refers to himself in the third person? <laughs> uh <laughs> he he and then corrects himself he he says but to do with associating with blake with me i corrected which is just like a uh oh kind of moment it's funny this didn't really stand out to me that was like again uh i i saw it initially as a thing that was sort of separating rose's stream of consciousness from blake's like it was sort mm. of, you know he was just kind of reading off rose's thing and saw blake and he was like oh well that's actually me like you know just kind of interjecting um seeing you seeing you pull it out like this has you know got the tinfoil rustling um of course uh <laughs> sorry so <laughs> i you know I'll, I'll be interested to see if this goes anyway I, I it definitely didn't stand out to me what stood out to me more was the line directly preceding this where um the the reason what well, the the reason association with blake comes up is because uh evan looks like shit uh, and has feathers sticking up, and Rose is like, "Well, it's nothing to do with what we've been giving him. It's the association with Blake." Mm. Um, and so that was, I mean, you know, we've been complaining about what Blake has been doing to Evan, uh, and now we see Rose is seeing physical manifestations <laughs> of, of that concern. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, we always knew it was a problem, right? We can track <laughs> yeah. Evan's deterioration over the course of the story. Um, so Blake and Conquest are kind of facing off, um, and Blake, uh, tells Conquest that he knows that she doesn't have as much power as she pretends to, which is the Conquest special. <laughs> um, uh, Blake basically says, hey, look, we don't have to be enemies here. We could be allies. And Conquest's response is, check the name, buddy. That's not how it works. <laughs> uh, and just starts attacking Blake. It's interesting. I, I was a bit confused by this whole bit because, um... Conquest kind of opens this by stating, oh, we, we may even be an e even match if we were at odds. Mm. And then she makes it very clear. She's not interested in teaming up. And, and so, like, I'm not, I'm not sure. It's interesting how Conquest kind of goes from if we were at odds, like, hypothetically, we might be an even match to just, like, chokeholding um, Blake. And, like, I think she also mentions, like, that he's raw and that she can examine him. Mm. Um, and that he has these spirits within him that are like you know will self protect that he um that conquest has has been removing from rose so like i don't i don't know i was like confused i was like is is conquest just attacking blake or is she doing some other thing because the the start of the conversation gave me the impression she wasn't planning to attack mm. so the only other thing i've thought is like if she's maybe trying to trigger his spiritual immune system um because maybe it will indiscriminately attack, and as, long, as well as attacking Conquest, it will start to attack Rose, and that obviously won't go over well. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um, my read on it was just, well, I don't think I have a good why for why Conquest is attacking, besides just, you well, know, it's Conquest. subsuming like, you Blake. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, I just, I got the impression, like, there, there was just a few things Conquest said that gave me the impression that she didn't plan to attack him, and then she just kind of does, and I was like, whoa, mm. like, so that that was why I started trying to come up with maybe she's not trying to directly attack him, but mm. trying to sabotage him in some way. And yeah. That was all I could come up with. Interesting. We'll have to see, I suppose. Um, this is such an abstract fight, right? And and this is something I've kind of wanted to touch on for a while, but I wanted to wait until we were far enough along. Like, it's a common criticism that I've read of Pact before we started doing this show that that people don't like it because the magic and the systems are too... Um, interpretive they're too open to interpretation which makes it hard to predict i suppose isn't that exactly what's cool about it like well, <laughs> see, yeah this is the thing I, like i think there's a lot of the systems that are interpretive but that's that does make it cool and it it never feels like the story plays out in a way that is not a pure logical progression right yeah um, yeah and and okay this bit where conquest basically is choking blake's neck and blake's like i don't have arms but i have a neck <laughs> like what the heck world <laughs> um and but i think it's the perfect kind of weird thing that it makes sense when you consider that's probably just the fact that blake doesn't have the ability to interpret himself having arms in this space whereas conquest can interpret him having a neck like why not 
Conquest knows more about this space, so <laughs> give him a neck and then start choking him. Yeah, I've kind of liked the um the symbolic basis. I mean, well, we've talked about it so much in Pact about how cool that is, and I think I think it complements something like like Parahumans so well because Parahumans is obviously very like rules based. Yes, and, and once you sort of understand someone's power, you kind of get it and and can like theorize very scientifically almost about how it's going to interact with other things. Whereas like, yep. like Pact is kind of a cool different take where it's it's almost the exact opposite and it defies rules. Um, and I like, I like that. I like that variety basically. Um, like I, I love it in Pact, um, because it's so different. Yeah. And I think, I think it leads to a lot of innovative solutions. Like Blake is a protagonist yeah. that works in this world because he is a innovator. He is a experimenter. He is someone who just does random shit that he thinks will work and believes that it will. And then it does. And it's awesome. Well, well, yeah, I mean, basically at its core, the rules of the Pact first are, can, can you convince the spirits that your bullshit is <laughs> is on point. It, it actually reminds me of D and D a lot, where it's like yeah. DMing. You set up a puzzle and you uh, let it have multiple solutions, and it's the job of your player to basically convince you that they've found a valid answer to a puzzle, and then you're kind of like, <laughs> all right, I'll let that work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, and so so going back to the the situation at hand here, like conquest she kind of just tells him oh you're more yep. attached to your neck and that's why it's still there um i mean i i kind of feel like conquest is maybe you know obviously not lying i don't i don't think she can outright lie but yep. uh pushing blake's mind in a certain direction cuz uh blake's neck got got did a, a number of times like he got he, he got his neck cut or couldn't speak or had a cru- i think i think even barbatorum got at it a couple of chapters ago so the idea to me that Blake has a neck but not arms just kind of <laughs> falls falls like I could I think this is maybe an idea conquest is trying to seed in his head as much as um it, it, like it, it is true like it may have been true mm. right at the start but I think conquest saying it is is her trying to reinforce it interesting uh, and and you know I wonder if Blake can just sort of overcome it by realizing that his neck got attacked multiple times. It's definitely not real. Like this is ridiculous. Yeah, uh, I suppose we will we will see if there's a grander motive to behind Congress actions here. I just no no comment. What well, what Blake has to do, right? This is great because this is so Blake. He has to sacrifice his concept of a neck. <laughs> he's beyond <laughs> he's beyond physically sacrificing parts of his body. He has to physically or he has to like sacrifice yeah. his his want or his understand like or his need to have parts of his body yeah, this like is, this is blake plus plus right here <laughs> it's really the next level um <laughs> so uh, as they're fighting uh they their fight kind of gets interrupted uh because there's a bigger thing that seems to be happening um <laughs> rose notices that mrs lewis is up ahead in the path um and so congress and blake both just kind of watch this scene play out um <laughs> Rose is uh, asked by Mrs. Lewis, uh, you know, are you joining us? Give me your answer if you will join us or not. And Rose is forced to decline. And uh, Mrs. Lewis uh, seems disappointed. <laughs> uh, and it seems like things are about to pop off. So Rose starts drawing on Conquest's strength. And Conquest starts to get stronger and starts to choke Blake more and more. <laughs> um. Yeah, and so again, like this whole idea of um, like the tie between Conquest and Rose is further reinforced by when Conquest first looks up, she's like, "I expected this," and then those are the words Rose repeats as she starts to draw on Conquest. Mm. Uh so like again, like I feel like we're tying these two together, um, and then <laughs> Miss Lewis is sort of like, "Oh, and you know, Mister Thorburn's in there, but he can't speak," and like. I just totally got the impression. I, I have this impression of her as almost omnipotent. Yes, and I can totally see her. She know, like she can almost visualize conquest choking Blake. Like she knows exactly what's going on, but it's Miss Lewis, so she just does nothing about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Like she, she, she's always so good. She's just kind of so casually powerful. It's great. Yeah, it's it leads to this really interesting web of problems that they are now facing right because mrs lewis is obviously too strong for rose not to draw on conquest if they even want to have a chance 
Um, I mean, I, even even if she draws all yeah. the conquest, I don't know if they have much of a chance. But it, yeah, like I see yes. what you're saying. And then, but of course, leading on conquest means Blake is going to be killed. And of course, we know Green Eyes is heavily stalking Rose, which is waiting for you know news that Blake is injured before she fucking pounces. Like, there's a a very clear web of alliances and threats and enemies that is all being set up here that I think is a really interesting one to watch play out. Yeah, well, and it's not just that because you're right. There's like. You know, we've got Conquest, uh, Miss Lewis, I'm still convinced Faisal or the Barber like, might make a, a second appearance. Mm. Um, no, knowing Faisal, he might have even decided to include the lawyers in one of his schemes. <laughs> uh, like, who the fuck knows? Um, so, so there's like there's so many things. And on top of that, we're st- it still feels like we're getting our footing around the the complex web of interaction possibilities that is Blake possessing rose yeah so like it, it's it's such a weird middle of an arc because i feel like we're halfway through like what, what's a relatively short short arc and we've just had an absolute shit ton of new stuff dropped on us like i have no idea what to expect from the next like four four chapters or so yeah it really feels like one that could go in literally any direction <laughs> <laughs> yeah like there's there's so much going on right now and like knowing that we're only just, 20 ish chapters away from the end i'm kind of like there's there's too much going on like i feel like we're gonna have to rush some of it and that's a bit of a bummer but Mm. um there's there's so much going on like i can't it's gonna be great either way like this wobbo has for the last 20 chapters given himself a lot of stuff to play with yeah time for the pieces to all kind of line up um Mm -hmm. i mean now now i guess we get to see what uh, what conflict with the lawyers is like which (laughs) uh you know it's probably probably not fun Yep, I'm sure it won't be. <laughs> uh, but to see the specifics, we'll have to come back next time, because that's the end of Possession 15.5. Yeah, uh, and so for our bonus bit uh, this chapter, we're going to do a quick quick short dive on, like, sort of the history, I guess, of of Possession, like spiritual Possession mm. um, in, in uh, this here real world. Um, so tell us about it, Elliot. What do we know about <laughs> Possession? Yeah, um, so this is probably not surprising to anyone, but um, obviously, like, the, the, the concept of being possessed by ghosts or spirits or even gods, demons, aliens, um, is, is pretty universal. Um, there was, like, a 1969 study quoted that said around 75% of, of almost 500 societies that were surveyed, there was, like, people who checked that they believed in possession, hmm. um, which is actually lower than I would have expected, to be honest. Yeah. Um. But, uh, you know, like it, it does make sense to me that possession is such a universal thing because I think people have always been pretty shit at misunderstanding, sorry, or been good at misunderstanding mental illness and, yeah, at, and even physical illness. At ascribing illnesses to supernatural things, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, there's there's an interesting trend here where some of it is trying to explain the unexplainable, like, so, so some sort of illness, and then the other half is kind of clearly just people trying to not take responsibility for their actions. Um <laughs> I love that. Yeah, so normally, like, with these sorts of things, we sort of trace how ideas have have been evolving in various cultures or, like, over yeah. time. Uh, we can't really do that here because it's so widespread. Yeah, um, it's too... It's, it, there are so many different places that came up with similar ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, like, I just sort of wanted to talk about some of the interesting ones that I saw. Um while doing some research for this um like something i just want to start with like a common trend here is that usually shamans or or whatever equivalent um it's very common to have this idea that they're opening themselves up to the spirits to be possessed to get whatever abilities they need for whatever they're up to Mm. um and one one thing that actually came up in in multiple places separately was this idea of spirit spouses which were like some sort of spirit that the shaman was sort of permanently bonded to um or or tied to and gave them specific boons and and was like always there to help them out so it kind of sounds like it's just a familiar um and it's great each spirit like it's not like a patron where it can be multiple shamans have the same patron it's a a more of a familiar relationship where it's a one-to-one yeah i mean it varied like obviously like but it it was just one of the things where as i was reading it it was just like god walbo must have done research into this stuff because that is so spot on yeah uh, to to how familiars work like sometimes i'm just reading some of this this ancient mythology stuff and it's just like god i could see that fitting impact so perfectly like the 
the world Wildbo has glued together just seems to perfectly slot into so many ancient mythologies. And that's really a testament to the flexibility of this system. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's a lot of, um, I guess, convergent evolution of this stuff as well, right? Different people coming up yeah. with ideas of familiar-esque things that kind of ba- tie together uh, due to colonialism or break apart due to whatever else. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Um, yeah. Um, so, so to dive into some cool examples of possession. Um, yeah, hit me with them. So there's lots of cultures that, you know, have spirits that will target people based on certain attributes. So like, you know, they target old people, or they, you know, they target based on age, on on wealth. That that was a surprisingly common one. I saw a lot of references to spirits that specifically target poor or wealthy people. Mm. Um, and, and then obviously like lots that target specific like sexes. Um, so, you know, there's usually like this combination of, oh, we have these spirits that target Ma- males yeah. these that target females these that can you know do either um I-, I thought a particularly interesting group uh was the spirits from the sadama people in ethiopia and kind of the digo people in kenya mm. um where well, they had this spirit who would possess people u- usually women although in both cultures like sometimes men and the only way to alleviate the the condition uh, is to give the spirit a bunch of luxury goods that the person has to hold on to uh, forever <laughs> to keep the spirit away. Uh, Which what a good scam! <laughs> yeah. Um. In fact, there have been instances of people being accused of falsely claiming possession <gasps> no. of these spirits. Which, no way. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, so that was a a relatively benign um and kind of. A fun example I love of spirit, it. That's a good spirit one. <laughs> possession. Um, I, I, the, whoever came up with that, it's a strong play. Um, in uh, Mayotte, uh, uh, sorry, it, it's a French controlled island uh, mm. just off of Africa. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, there was this really interesting sort of study done, and they found like over 20% of women um, from, from this one sort of culture on the island had like a history of entering this sort of trance state where they they're controlled by a spirit and the spirit will sort of talk to like their family and stuff and like give them orders or explain what they want to do um yeah what they want to do because the whole thing is there's there's actually just like a a finite set of these spirits Mm. and they sort of maintain their personality and their their opinions between possessions so interesting there was um they have this kind of big ritual sort of around it. So there's all this sort of dancing and stuff going on. And then like, like a daughter of, of one family would sort of pull off and, and be in this trance and be possessed by like a certain spirit who would tell sort of the father, you know, it, it wanted X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and it would address the father in a way that was not at all sort of the, the way the daughter would normally talk to the father, according to the, the researchers who were documenting this. But like then, you know, a couple of weeks later, they might do another one of these things, and and that same spirit would inhabit someone else. Mm. And there, were, so you know, it was kind of like having something like the great gods with their own personalities or something, but um, just these spirits that would inhabit people in this area. Like I, I thought that was a, a really interesting and unique take on. Yeah, it. that is very. It does seem very different to to other types of possession, which I guess now that I think of it, do feel very disparate. Yeah, yeah, and and like. The, again like the the whole all like all across the world there was a, almost an entire gamut of possession being good bad or like you know either yeah and this one seemed more like a kind of neutral one like this was just a sort of fact of life it was the impression i got from you know admittedly like briefly skimming one research paper sure um that you know just sort of talked about how it was just sort of something that this culture saw they had to do they do this they do this ritual some girls would enter the trance be possessed by some of these certain spirits and they do stuff to appease those spirits mm. yeah um yeah uh to jump around a bit um I- islam uh has examples of people being possessed by jinn which i'm mostly bringing up because it, it feels like a, a nice callback <laughs> to, to our old monster corner on fair there. enough um like I, again just talking about good versus bad possession like jinn were one where depending on the jinn because remember we talked in that monster corner jinn well, like humans, they they could yeah. be good or bad. Like you know, they they were going to yeah. be judged on their sin. Um, so jinn possession can be. It's a bit of a roll of the dice. Depends on which jinn uh, possesses you, basically. Yeah, fair enough. Could be good. Could be bad. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then uh, the last and, and probably my favorite one of these is by <laughs> the um, Europeman people of the the New Guinea Highlands, um, who have this really cool and and 
unique sort of Christian derived ritual um, that's name is translated to Spirit Disco. <laughs> That's such a good name. <laughs> yeah, it's a fantastic name for a ritual. Um, and so basically what they do is they all gather in a church at night and they kind of like go nuts dancing to this mix of like Christian songs, like like, like Christian hymns, um, and then like traditional like songs mm. from, from the from the indigenous people. And then also those sometimes those traditional songs with Christian lyrics added to the top. So interesting. The, the traditional instruments of the indigenous people, but they've they've added like Christian lyrics to it. Um and, and basically what happens is is people during this uh, apparently get possessed by the Holy Spirit. And so this this manifests them dancing even crazier and sometimes just sort of falling on the ground and kind of sounded like basically having a seizure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and the whole idea here being that if the Holy Spirit can can come inside you, you know, it helps wash away sin. So yeah. they describe people as being heavy with sin beforehand and the holy spirit washes through you and makes you makes you lighter um but i think like the most fascinating part of this to me is um like what was a little afterward in this section which was the european people have no traditional concept of spiritual possession they they were originally in that 25 percent that didn't think about possession of things yeah and then somehow the uh, you know the introduction of christianity into the culture has created um spirit discos and and simultaneously introduce the idea of possession yeah well i guess if your first experience of that is the concept of being possessed by the by the holy ghost you know that that kind of tracks right why why wouldn't that be a way of being cleansed of sin the possession of the holy ghost and then it takes takes over your body for a bit and then that's that's purification oh yeah for sure but i i think it's interesting because uh i i, I mean Christianity in and of itself, like that's obviously a very wide spectrum. Yeah. And I think it has its own, its own sort of blotted history with the concept of possession. It's yes. stronger in some arms of, of the religion than others. And, and so I think it's interesting that in this particular instance, along with Christianity, seemingly has come a very strong idea of spiritual possession, whereas it's not usually something that's always associated super strongly with the religion, at least for, for me in, in a yeah. modern day. Yeah. Interesting. Man, I love finding out about all these different takes on uh, cultural ideas. It's so much fun. It's one of the funnest parts of doing this podcast is just tracking spiritual and supernatural con concepts. Yeah, and this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Like this, this as we said, this stuff's so universal. It's all over the place. There's so many unique interpretations of what spiritual possession means and how it manifests. Cool. Good stuff. Um, oh, that's the end of our episode, though, I suppose. Uh, thanks for joining us, folks. If you have comments on this episode on spiritual possession, on uh, Blake being inside the you know TV screen of of their mind, um, <laughs> you can or, or answers to our discussion question, you can leave them in our discussion thread, which will be linked down below. Uh, as a reminder, that discussion question is: Was your harness's domain a good idea? <laughs> Uh, yes, and if you're interested in more shows from the Doof Network, if Deep Impact isn't releasing regularly enough for you, <laughs> uh, th there's plenty more of good stuff. Um, we we spoke a lot last episode about Kingslingers, uh, the new show. There's a, the first proper episode of that came out yesterday. Yes. Uh, so go check it out. As we said, Matt and Scott have switched roles. Scott is now the one who knows the future, and Matt is the one <laughs> um, probably freakishly guessing it. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, Scott has started doing this thing where he'll say, like, Mm, interesting and it's very clear that matt has just said something i mean i don't know because i'm reading this book for the first time as well but matt has just said something that has ramifications for later on and scott desperately wants to jump in and has to <laughs> stop himself it's a very fun experiencing that again <laughs> yeah I, I think after deep impact we're gonna have to do something where you're in the experience seat again because i i feel like i'd have the same problem i don't know if i can contain <laughs> the myself worst. Um, but yeah I, i'm really enjoying king slingers so far so check that out yeah, um, and, and then obviously uh, this episode is a few hours late, um, or it's going to be, it, or it is when you listen, anyway, um, the, but, you know, so a few hours ago, uh, you know, you've hopefully been keeping yourself busy with uh, the Doofcasts episode on Young Justice, yep. uh, which I'm very so excited, so excited. They watched They watched season one, which in my opinion is the best season, although I still haven't seen season three because it's not out in Australia yet. But, Yay. Uh, that's fine. I'm over that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, go go check out the Young Justice episode. I'm sure it's going to be phenomenal. Yeah, I absolutely love Young Justice. It's one of those shows like Avatar that just holds a special place in my heart. Um, so I'm really excited for that episode. 
Yeah, I mean, like, because we it was one of our early early Media MD episodes yeah, that, that, that we true. did Young Justice. Um, and I think like, it's interesting for me. I'd I'd put Young Justice alongside Worm, or no, opposite Worm is kind of. I think they both made superhero well classic superheroes work for me in very different ways. Mm. Young Justice kind of proved that the old DC comics are actually viable if you do them properly, whereas Worm <laughs> kind of reconstructed the whole genre. Yeah, Young Justice has done something for me that I thought was impossible, and that was it made me want to keep watching the CW uh, shows <laughs> just because I loved the Young Justice characters so much. Like um, Green Arrow in Young Justice is such a fun and interesting character that it actually made me want to keep watching Arrow after I'd already given up like three seasons in. Yeah, and that's high praise because if you've seen those CW superhero shows, yeah. you know that they can be tough to get through. Yes. Um, yes. So a- a- anyway, um, uh, we're, we're rambling on. <laughs> go, go listen to Young Justice and go watch Young Justice. It Gr- is actually great really show. Good. A classic. Um, and, you know, if you want to support Kingslingers, which only exists because of Doof patrons, yeah. head on over to patreon.com forward slash Doof Media. There's a bunch of different tiers. You get different perks with each. Uh, at at the one dollar one, it only takes one dollar. You get access to our Discord, yeah, and you, you're helping to contribute to things like Kingslingers because all those um rewards that we're aiming for, it, it's based on the number of patrons. So you know, you just by signing up, you're helping to contribute to um whatever the next goal is. I forgot what it is. Whoops. <laughs> it's a uh, it's a produced audio drama. So Doof Media is uh, planning to, if we get enough patrons, produce our own uh like audio drama serialized audio drama so if you're interested oh, is in that, that is that's 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 matt's thing right uh maybe maybe yeah oh sorry yes <laughs> maybe. um yeah and uh, honestly just getting access to the discord for one dollar a month is pretty good there's there's infinite interesting conversation that takes place in here on a whole variety <laughs> of topics there's also stupid ones like we've got we've got you know if you want if you want nice analytical discussion we've got that if you want to have a stupid war about whether hot dogs are a sandwich yeah we, we've got that too yeah uh, if you go to the Parahuman subreddit often and find damn there's no new good content recently the Discord is the place for you because there's constantly new good content there yes uh, speaking of the Parahuman subreddit uh, Wabo has a Patreon. Patreon.com. How, how is that Wobble. speaking of the Parahuman subreddit? Well, he, he I mean, the, the Parahuman subreddit exists because yeah, of Wobble, right? Yeah, I suppose. I feel like it's I, a tenuous I mean, it's, segue. Yeah, I mean, it could it could have just been speaking of Pact. Yeah, as speaking we have of been doing for over an hour now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I go to Wobble's patron. Um, he, he, you, you patron him. You, we keep getting these stories. It's as simple as that, and that's a good enough reason to, in my opinion, if you can. Yeah, he loves being patronized, so uh, go do it. Um, I don't. Okay. No, I think that's. Uh, I think that's <laughs> correct. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thanks for joining us, folks, and we will see you on Monday, the twentieth of January, for our next episode, Possession fifteen point six. See you then.